All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Entre Nous uh, at the American Library in Paris. My name is Emily Biggs. I am the programs assistant here at the library. And tonight I am so honored and delighted to be welcoming two brilliant minds to the library, uh, Kate Briggs and Yasmin Seal, to be discussing Kate's new work, The Long Form, uh, which is a remarkable, remarkable novel that I highly recommend. Uh, the Entre Nous series is organized in partnership with the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination, as well as the Columbia Global Center's Paris office, which is at Reed Hall. If you're not familiar with that, I highly encourage you to go check it out. They're doing wonderful work here. I see some familiar faces in the audience who are very affiliated with that, so look into them. Uh, just a couple of notes before we get started. We will be selling copies of the long form after the event that Kate may be signing, if she is feeling so willing, uh, through the Red Wheelbarrow. And after about 45 minutes of this discussion, we'll be opening it up to questions from you in the audience uh, and there in that little box on Zoom. Hello, Zoom audience. Thank you for joining us. Uh, on to our wonderful speakers tonight. Kate Briggs is the translator of two volumes of Roland Barthes' lecture and seminar notes at the Collège de France, the preparation of the novel and how to live together, both published by Columbia University Press. She teaches at the Piet Zwart Institute, which I may be mispronouncing, in Rotterdam. Uh, the long form, her debut novel, follows this little art, which is a genre-bending essay on translation. And she was recently awarded a Wyndham Campbell Prize. Uh, Yasmin Seal is a writer and translator based in Paris. Her essays on literature, art, and film have been published in Harper's, The Nation, The Paris Review, and many other places. She is the author with Robin Moger of Agitated Air, Poems After Ibn Arabi, and her translations from Arabic include The Annotated Arabian Nights and Something Evergreen Called Life, which is a collection of poems by Rania Mamoun. She is currently a fellow at the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination. She is no longer a fellow at the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination, but she was very recently. Um, Kate, Yasmin, thank you both so much for being here with us tonight. Can we have a big round of applause, please? Thank you so much, Emily. Can you hear me all right? Um, thank you all for being here. Thanks to those who are apparently following online. It's hard to believe it. Um, Thank you to the library for organizing this and to the Institute um, for co-sponsoring. My fellowship technically ended last week, so this feels like a sneaky way of prolonging it for one more day. Um, it's a deep joy to be in conversation with Kate Briggs, who I have such great admiration for, and to be celebrating the, the publication of this quite extraordinary novel. Um, although, Perhaps we'll come back to this. One of the questions it asks is whether it is a novel and what a novel even is. And it, it sort of wrestles with, with genre in fascinating ways. Um, as Emily mentioned, um, this is Kate's first novel, but um, Kate has already received widespread acclaim and admiration for a first book, This Little Art, um, which is an essay on translation, um, but a deeply unusual and original one. Um, it's quite a remarkable text that weaves together elements of memoir and history. It's a kind of collage, very original, very delightful, very different from a lot of writing about translation. And I know I'm not alone among translators in having found it utterly refreshing um, and salutary and important. It's already in, in the space of a few years become a, a fundamental text that's very widely taught and read. Um, when I read it, I think not long before after it came out, I remember being struck by the unusual combination of qualities in Kate's writing, how simultaneously rigorous and joyful it is. Its appetite for scholarly and theoretical analysis coexisting with a passionate attention to the ordinary and the everyday and the embodied without drawing much of a distinction of hierarchy between those things. There's a special tension in that book, and this is one of the things I appreciate most about Kate's writing, between the ambition of its scope and its originality, and at the same time, a tone and an approach that's modest and subtle and speculative, again, something quite rare, 
in general and particularly in um, writing about translation, which for some reason seems to invite grand and grandstanding claims. Um, so Kate's writing is at the same time wonderfully assured and at the same time constantly self-questioning and digressive as if there were two voices or, or many. I had the pleasure of meeting Kate for the first time um, earlier this year in February in Amsterdam in a poetry bookshop um, which had laid a, a gold tablecloth between us, um, which I now feel has spoiled me for other bookshops. <laughs> it's quite difficult now to be reading without a gold tablecloth between us. Um, we gave a reading together and it was, it was there that I first heard an excerpt from the long form. I think this was before it, it was published. Um, I think you read a section from early on in the novel, which is a description of a mobile, um, not a phone, but a, a structure above a, a baby's bed. Um, and, and hearing that passage and, and since then reading the novel was wonderful because um, there were all the qualities that I'd found in this little art, but the move into imaginative writing, I felt, um, had allowed an even richer and more inventive kind of phrase making uh, to emerge. And I just wanted to read a few lines from that description. Kate's going to read a, a longer passage, um, but just to give you a sense of what excited me so much, I'm just going to read you some of my favorite lines. <laughs> um, Um, this is just a few lines from the description of the mobile. Rose is the name of a baby. Thrumming beneath it, for Rose it was like this. The mobile, like her sensing of the world. It was near and juddery, gapped with negative space, edgy and alive, more or less monochrome, hatched with greys, bright pieces and looms of darker, heated shadow. And hearing this, I, I felt that passage combined um, what I so love in, in Kate's writing, which is that combination of the practical and the ordinary with a kind of um, abstract thinking going on in the background, that description of a, an object above a baby's bed also seemed to me to be a description of a text gapped with negative space, more or less monochrome. Um, and uh, just a, a couple more great lines from the book just to show you how excited I am about this writing. Um, a description of two housemates folding sheets, a weekly ritual like a short folk dance, or this description of a baby, Rose flexed the space-time around her, it flexed back, or just this perfect true sentence, birds and flowers are almost always fantastic. Kate, I think we would love it if you could read um, a longer section for us and perhaps tell us something about the book or at least situate the passage you're going to read. Thank you. I mean, I can and I, and I will, but I feel so um, full of feeling from that extraordinary introduction and and sort of, um, gift of of your words and your just re re yeah I'm, I'm now fully inarticulate which is not a great place to kind of begin um perhaps i'll just read but thank you yasmin that's deeply meaningful and just to have your um it's you know it, as i'm sure lots of you know in the room it's a it's a very vulnerable thing publishing <laughs> um uh, it it produces in at least in me a great vulnerability so to have a have the book return to you in that way um, through your work and your sensibility is deeply meaningful. So we could just go home now, um, you know, but uh, anyway, I, I, I won't, I'll, I'll read from, um, I thought I'd read a section from the book slightly further on, um, which I hope gives a sense of um, how the book tries to move and the sorts of um, questions it tries to hold together and the sort of spaces, um, the moves it makes and the spaces it moves through, uh, the registers it moves through. Um, and perhaps the only thing to know, um, so this is, yeah, about 100, 120 pages in, uh, the only thing really to know is that the first long sequence of the book involves a sort of extended process of getting a newborn uh, baby to sleep, getting her down, um, down into a chair um, underneath a mobile. Um, and it's not a spoiler, this isn't a novel kind of full of, um, events in the perhaps in the more 
Well, it, one of the questions it, it asks is what 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 is a novelistic event? You know, what is plot, and what you know, what how do we scale that? And a kind of plot element or a a big event, at least in the terms of the book, is a doorbell rings having just got the newborn um, to sleep, um, which causes drama and frust frustration on the part of um, her mother. So that's, yeah, as I say, I don't feel like, also it rains later in the book. <laughs> these, are, these are the events that happen. Um, About but 300 lot, pages yeah, in, 300 it rains. Um, uh, we can talk about um, event, the eventness of the event maybe uh, later on. So um, this, section begins the first I'll read three uh, sections and they all have their own small titles and the first one is called layers alternations the view presented by the corner of her desk was of layers engineered wood its relative strength its dimensional stability was achieved by exactly this layering alternating the desktop was a compound made from cheaper thinner and more flimsy materials all of them pressed and glued together none of which could have managed any kind of support work on its own. Specifically, made by turning each new layer at least 90 degrees before gluing, thereby alternating the direction of the grain. Sideways on, the plywood looked like a sandwich, like her Nana's sandwich sponge, while in front of it, the mobile jogged and turned. In Henry Fielding's new province of writing, his proposition for a novel, it was like this. It wanted to tell a story. It wanted to describe itself. It wanted to open, to unfold its own fictional world, for this world to hold heady, steady enough for someone else to believe in. It wanted also to think around and about it, its world, its project, roaming in the wider vicinity of itself, bringing in, as well as pointing outward towards, other subjects, other books, and fields of activity invoking authorities and not necessarily authorities from the broader social world, writing the names Horace, Homer, and Aristotle on pages that faced, touched, those recounting the made-up lives of Molly Seagram, Mrs. Deborah Wilkins, Tom Jones. Why? It's a question a reader might ask. Why these mixed materials, the switch and turn, the discontinuous exposition? Why, when the narrator of Tom Jones himself will later draw attention to the essayistic parts, the commentary parts, and call them the boring parts, the skippable, dispensable, blah, blah, blah parts, the send you to sleep, soporific parts. It was a literary historical question, a category question, a genre question. In the rise of the novel, Ian Watt called Tom Jones only part novel. Lionel Trilling agreed. It was more literary criticism than anything else. It was also an aesthetic question, a rhythm question, a technical compositional question rephrasable as a knowledge production question, as a social political question, a co-living and how to keep going, how to carry on question. If Helen could continue reading, give it time, she would find the question not only phrased but addressed, close to 200 years ago now, in the novel she'd only just begun. If it worked, in the sense that if the composition worked for her, managed to activate, to catch, then maintain its hold on her attention, she would find an answer set out, ventured at least. If she could be left alone to read, to settle into her book, pages would be turned, time would pass, and eventually she'd get there. But Rose, her focus had come unattached. It was roving now, ranging and insecure. She was starting to fret. A leg kicked more vigorously in jerky agitation, falling out of time with herself. Helen moved to put her right hand across the rise of Rose's belly and waited for her body to quieten, for her attention to catch at and again be caught by, by some movement above her, a sharp or shaky basic shape, some rudimentary distinction. But Rose, she hadn't slept. She had fed, but she hadn't properly slept for hours now. Helen knew that her interested occupation of that setting, the sort of small holding she'd made for her within the larger occupancy of the living room, was only ever temporary. She could prolong their sitting together like this for maybe just a few moments longer, but Rose would need something else soon. I'm here. Helen reached over and twisted the top of the mobile, setting it going again. 
But Rose was vexed, vexing, fretting, fussing, such small words for her amplifying, now outsized agitation. The shapes of the mobile swung against and hit each other. They lost the maintenance of their distance, their respect for interspace. They jolted and bashed over her. They did nothing for her, having nothing anymore to offer her. For Rose, there had been too much of this for too long now. Helen dipped the rim of the chair, a last effort to stay their bit of calm, bring Rose back to the rhythm she'd lost or forgotten. But Rose, every limb kicked out now. She was boxing with her whole surroundings, having a local fight with the air, her fret, fret, fret pitched in volume and urgency. Helen undid her action, stilled the chair. Would that be enough? Above the, their heads, she could hear the footsteps, the landlady moving about. I'm here. Surely her adjacency, her presence spoke for her. Would that be enough? I'm still here. And you know what? He'd heard her. Through the front door, after he rang the doorbell, pressing hard, then pressing again, making himself heard in order to get this thing done, one more thing delivered, in order to get on and deliver something else. The street had been empty, all quiet, deep set and leafy, a cat under a tree, staring at his legs. There'd been no one else about, and he'd heard her shout at him through the panelled wood, the bub bubbled glass of the door's small window pane. Some woman shout swearing, then pulling open the front door and aggressing him with the supercharge of her whole body. It didn't matter. He'd made her angry, raging, whatever, it didn't matter. She'd blasted her angry out at him and he'd turned, ducked down the steps to get out of the way, but still he'd received a bit of it. So what? He could let it go. He was back in his van, temporarily parked in a different nearby street. The spare front seat colorful and crowded with yesterday's wrappers, three empty water bottles. Tunes on. It's not what you need though, is it? He could let it go. Still, he was aggravated because it was seriously not what you or not what any person needs. Why not just put a note on it, raging lady? Big, adult girl, the front door, the bell. You could just put a note on it if you don't want people to bring you the stuff you order, delivering it directly into your hands. He pressed his eyelids with the pads of his longer fingers, then glanced down at his phone. He spoke to it for a moment, willing it to light up. He had spent the past few hours speaking quietly into it, coaxing it, willing it to light up for a message to rise and bloom, thick and lily-like on its surface. Not just anything from anyone, but a message addressed to the core of him. Some tender, hey babe, how are you? Love you, I love you. A cat in love, a bear, a bear in love. It didn't matter what she sent. Only he did need something, some new confirmation, some each morning renewed confirmation of shared feeling from the person he'd loved from childhood, always at a distance then recently much closer, at first too scared to stand next to her, in a room, even, let alone to speak to her, to touch her. It was painful to need it. He felt swollen with it. It was painful to wait. His phone, he called into it silently. It was a magic pond, an ink-black rectangle of wishing well. If he were to touch it anywhere other than its white and silver rim, it would take his fingertips, given half a chance, it could swallow a hand. It could sink his arm all the way down to the elbow, then pull him in further. He'd lose his torso. He'd be sunk to the neck in its deep liquid power. Within seconds, it could claim and be drowning the whole of his heart. Actually, I realize in that thing when you get going with a reading that a crucial bit of information that I didn't give, apart from the fact that the doorbell rang um, and there was a young man delivering something, was that what was delivered into the space, the sort of living room of the novel, is a novel, um, an old novel, an old secondhand to Helen new novel, which is Henry Fielding's Tom Jones, which is a novel built from fiction parts and essay parts. And that would have been really useful to know, to sort of understand the sort of plywood compound mode. Um, but the, so that's what is now in the room. And Helen, the, the adult character, will start, start reading the book through, through the book. See what I mean? <laughs> um, yeah, so there are these two strands, really. There's the story 
quite a small story in a way of Helen and her newborn baby spending a day together. Um, the novel takes place over the course of a day, but interwoven with that story, if you like, or I'm not sure what to call it, not, not really a plot, that situation is Helen's reading of this novel, which has just arrived. Um, and what then become reflections on the novel that I feel over the course of the book become detached from Helen's reading of it and become almost a kind of essay on Tom Jones um, that sits alongside that first situation. Um, but maybe we could start with a question in the, the passage you just read, um, why these mixed materials? Um, on the face of it, this is um, a rather strange novel um, because it contains a lot of material that um, would more usually perhaps belong to the essay. Um, there's a lot of engagement with the work of other writers, not only other novels and principally um, Tom Jones, but also essays and scholarship. Um, you quote many thinkers and philosophers, Winnicott, John Dewey, E.M. Forster, um, sometimes very playfully, very wittily. And there's a wonderful scene in the middle of the novel where Helen has a fantasy of interrupting Forster's lectures on aspects of the novel at Cambridge in the 1920s. And she goes in with her baby because Forster's talking about time in the novel. And she, she barges in and says, um, I know time <laughs> because I'm unlearning it because the baby doesn't know time. Um, and um, so, so there are these sort of playful engagements, but also deep critical engagements with all of this other writing. Um, and one way of understanding this is that you're proposing a kind of hybrid form, um, something that is part novel like that description of Tom Jones, part criticism or essay. Um, and it's certainly very original. I mean, I haven't read another novel like it. It's, as well as this mixture of voices, it's also, it's also has, it has quite a bit of um, visual play, um, arrangements of, of words on the page and also a series of diagrams, mysterious diagrams that go through the book. Um, but another way of reading it is maybe that you're saying that the novel has always been only partly itself and has always been that hybrid form and is a container um, that can stretch to include all kinds of things. And that because the novel is not one thing, it can be anything. Um, and in fact, the very earliest English novels are marked by that sense of generic instability and experimentation. Um, so I'm fascinated by that, by that sort of double perspective this novel seems to have, that it's stretching the form and it, I think inventing a new form by returning to first principles and to the very early history of the novel. I think absolutely. I mean, you said, um, you sort of described back to me some of the motivations indeed for, for thinking. I mean, maybe one way of sort of entering the question is through what I was saying about um, plot and that it rains. You know that the I think one of the one of the one of the ways that I was thinking the momentum or the sort of suspense of the book could work could be if you are interested in such questions, um, which I not every reader will be. I understand, but these are questions that um, deeply interest me. Is this question of why 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 the essay parts you know why why when that's so interruptive I mean, you mentioned em forster in the aspects of the novel he says he he comments on fielding and tom jones um tom jones has these sort of interact introductory um comments descriptions of what um fielding thinks the novel is doing ahead of each one of its larger sections um and Forster says something like, nothing has been more detrimental to the novel than this, what Fielding is doing here, like sort of initiating a, initiating a world, initiating a reality that you hope this, like, you know, hope that will hold steady, that you, you, you know, you want with the pact of, that you make with a reader or the invitation that you make to a reader, you know, come in and, and believe in this. I'd like you to believe in this. I'd like you to believe that there is a woman and her name's Helen and 
Her name's Helen Strong, <laughs> which is a, a name lifted from a Gertrude Stein novel called A Novel of Thank You, which also appears in the novel. And there's a, a baby with the Steinian name Rose. And I'd like you to believe that as I'd like you to accompany them as, as, as they work on the project of getting to sleep first thing in the morning in the way that you do with a newborn. Um, it's first thing in the morning, but the first thing you're doing is trying to get back to sleep. Um, I'd like you to believe in that, but um, Forster was his objection to the sort of fielding esque, interruptive, essayistic mode was that you're constant. You know, how many times can you break the illusion without risking frustration and exasperation? There was something about that interruptive nature and that sort of setting, establishing a ground or reality that then gets interrupted and broken, which seemed to me to speak very much to the to the condition of co-living that I was trying to describe, which is living with a vulnerable, needy, unpredictable other human being. So that was partly why there is this sort of discontinuous exposition. But also I was just very interested in this question of, but here we have Fielding saying, I, I'm the father of the novel. I mean, he's like hubristically saying, I'm doing this. I'm inventing a new province of writing while also being very conscious of there being precedence and being very interested in his precedence. So this, this sort of claim to newness that's also like a strong recognition of precedence and, and deeply engaged with his precedence, um, with those who, who writers and thinkers that came before him, the, the essay parts in Tom Jones are very much citational and engaged with that. And so this question of like, why would you do it against all advice, you know, against Forster's advice that this is like not good for the, this is not what the novel does well. Um, the, the different path, if we think of that moment of 18th century sort of English language novel in, novel enthusiasm, um, the different path would be towards increasing cohesion, increasing structuredness, uh, increasing unity. So rather than having these multiple stories belonging to um, you know, this, the, you know, the idea of this sort of like collection of, sh of short stories, which are sort of held by a frame, <laughs> um, for example, um, that the move would be the novel becomes successful and the novel truly becomes the novel when we give up on that project and achieve something like cohesion of voice and plot and unity, centrality of character and focus. Um, but I guess I was just really interested in this counter edition, this pulling away from that. Um, and and to ask the question about sort of renewing that now, what might it mean to sort of take the precedent seriously, given a contemporary enthusiasm for the hybrid forms or books that that pair essay and fiction? What might what might be interesting about sort of lengthening the sort of um, scope of that conversation back to um, two hundred years ago, and how do we reckon with that? So. Yeah, those yeah, are some and, of the thoughts. And the book, yeah, that's wonderful. And the book is um, explicit about its debt to other books. Um, there's a sort of bibliography at the end where you cite not only the books that are explicitly mentioned in the book, but but all kinds of other books that you've taken an, an idea from or some inspiration from. And often um, that bibliography contains further thoughts and further commentary. So it's almost as if you're saying that that all writing is entanglement um, or recombination of some kind. And I wonder how that connects with translation, your work as a translator as well. Um, well I think, I mean, it connects with plywood, actually. <laughs> That's why the image of the plywood, sandwich. like yeah. Helen has a desk made of plywood in this sort of compound manufactured form. Millefeuille. Yeah, millefeuille, which is like the sandwich sponge, like layer, alternate layer. You know, I really like that image of this, this thickness achieved through might with these materials that might on their own be quite flimsy but if you if you glue them <laughs> um i mean obviously in a novel you know you get thickness when something is indeed glued and not being read and as soon as it's activated you get these they're set alongside each other in in, in an adjacency um but maybe just one thing to say about this why why the essays? Why do this? Why is the long form doing this? I mean, Henry Fielding does does offer an, an answer to those questions, which are their aesthetic questions, their rhythm questions. I think they're always they're also social questions, like why might we need non-continuity, discontinuity? What might be valuable about, about interruption? And and Henry Fielding 
does offer, which I won't expand on now, because that, that in a way is the plot of the book, for me at least, is sort of arriving at this, what he calls uh, the knowledge of contrast and why that might be aesthetically valuable and socially valuable. Um, so there is this answer to this question, like again phrased, um, hence the passage of Helen saying, you know, if I, she's initiated this reading process and if she, if she could read interruptedly, interrupt, uninterruptedly, she would get there um, eventually. And, and the novel does, the long form does get there uh, eventually. What you say about Forster's objection to that kind of interruptive mode um, sounds like, it sounds like what he's describing is self-consciousness that what you want is to be able to suspend disbelief and and to be interrupted by expository writing in that way makes the novel too self-conscious. Um, I think there's something very um, effective and comical actually about how self-conscious this novel is. And it reminds me of, um, it reminds me of Bart and of the preparation of the novel, which as Emily mentioned, um, Kate is also the translator of. Um, and the preparation of the novel is a, series of lectures that Barthes gave at the Collège de France in the late 70s, just before his death. And it was a real departure in his work, wasn't it? He sort of announced his intention to write a novel and then spent two years giving a series of lectures about how he was definitely going to write this novel. Um, and the lectures become a, a sort of series of notes about his struggle to get out from under his critical baggage. And he doesn't quite manage it. So it's full of reflections about other books. Um, but as far as I know, he you know he doesn't really produce <laughs> the, the fiction, um, and I was reminded of that in in this work. Although this you know this is a novel that is interwoven with um, uh, reflections on other books, but you could you could one way of describing it would be that it's trying to tell this story about a woman and her baby, but is constantly being interrupted or hijacked by its own awareness of the whole history of the novel and all the arguments about what a novel is or could be. Um, so that all the, the basic principles and conventions and techniques of the novel, like names or duration or omniscience are being examined and turned over. And those become, in a way that becomes the drama of the novel. Yeah. The reflection on those questions. No, I love that. Indeed, the yeah, and how you might locate the drama um, I guess maybe maybe that's one question that the the book tries to open is just um, where do where <laughs> where is the drama and what 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 deciding that this is not dramatic enough or um, indeed you know worth narrating worth the sort of um, attention it, it thinks about then tries to think about the novel as a kind of attention distribution mechanism in a way um, and what do we attend to and how might writing and description sort of draw things, draw out the drama, or, or, or maybe not draw out the drama. I think putting a, a newborn to sleep is quite a charged, tense process. <laughs> I think there is lived, great lived drama in such, a, um, it's just more making a space within, within novels, le letters for such um, scenes. Um, that I guess that's one ambition of the book, is just to make space, to ex extend the territory of the novel um, in such a way that it, it would include a being such as a, a baby um, who is forced to also aspects of the novel is actually really important to this book, um, pointed out that babies hardly ever appear in novels because they're not um, active, you know, they're not adult, they're not independent, they're not autonomous. Um, so therefore, according to a certain kind of conception of, of, um, of capacity to act, they don't, they're not yet enabled to act. Um, and I wanted to write a baby who is acting and flexing the world. And um, But in, in relation to self-consciousness, um, which I think is really important. And I think one of the, one of the reasons why the book is quite sort of un emphatically and unapologetically self-conscious, um, partly in, you know, it's interested in humor as well. It's, you know, it, that's, that's important to me to state. It's not all about, oh my God, my baby, I have to get my baby to sleep. It is like, you know, there's also humor um, or it's it's lightened, but um, by this sort of self-reflective mode, but also because just this this action of, of being responsible, um, doing something for the first time, Helen, is uh, she hasn't had a baby before. She hasn't um, been responsible for 
keeping um, another human alive before, uh, staying with the, in the way that, um, that, that that's necessary to, to, you know, with a vulnerable being. So she's doing it for the first time. And I think doing anything for the first time, especially when you might have a received sense of, of, of how it goes, what the protocols are. And I think with um, parenting, um, that's, you know, you have a very strong coded sense of what the protocols are, but you nevertheless find yourself um, making it up, improvising in relation to those um, rules of what should be happening at what time or how you're doing it well or wrong. And so I think it is a deeply self-conscious um, mode of existence. I think it is a self-questioning sort of, here I am doing this, embodying it, inhabiting it. And then that feeling of, here I, I am doing this. Like, <laughs> how is this, you know? So there was something about the, the nature of, of, the, of the, the practice I wanted to describe that seemed to um, uh, require a form of self-consciousness. And, and that was interesting to me that then that related to the, to the self-consciousness in, indeed in play in, in fielding, yeah. Right, and it seems to connect different, it seems to connect the possibility of different kinds of change perhaps um, this this idea of newness that it's a blank slate it's a new day beginning with a newborn it could be anything this day could involve anything this this newborn could be or do anything um, and that sense of newness has a kind of revolutionary potential about it or at least a sort of utopian it creates this kind of utopian space where all kinds of things become thinkable or possible um, or you can step outside the frame of what's usually thought or done to reinvent things or to re-examine them. Um, what you were just saying about humor also reminds me of another uh, wonderful part of the book where Tom Jones, the novel that Helen's just received is accidentally put in the washing machine and she hears it, she hears it spinning. Um, and, and she says, we washed the novel, <laughs> um, which is just a, a fabulous kind of description yeah. of what this novel does. Thinking about um, cohesion, I th and to come back to what you said about um, Barton preparing the novel, and I was very, at the time of translating um, that lecture course, the last lecture course, so there was the, the project to write a novel, and that was cut short by death, demise, you know, rather than um, the not that, that project is, in my understanding of it, um, the desire uh, petering out, I think. Um, so there was this desire for the novel, which is formulated in the lectures as a desire for flow, for continuity, for not the fragment, for a change in writing practice, for the long form. That's the type why the title of the book, The Long Form. It comes from Bach, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's his like synonym for the novel, um, the long form, you know, in relation to the short form or the shortest form, which he spends the first half, the first year of the preparing for a novel by talking about haiku, you know? So there's something that, and I, I didn't understand um, at the time, just sort of through chance or like my own circumstance, I was working on those translations while also um, looking after a newborn. And, um, and I understood the, so I was fe also feeling deeply de desirous of continuity and, cohesion and flow because my life my 24 hours the rolling of you know time had become interrupted um that was the, the new condition was sort of an interrupted time or lots of short parts of time where the transitions weren't entirely how to get from morning to afternoon or even from doing this this in this holding position to another became unobvious what i didn't understand um at the time of translating the lecture courses is that, you know, Bart's desire for cohesion and continuity and flow comes following bereavement. Um, I mean, I did understand it in the sense that he narrates this very clearly, but um, it was only sort of later in my own life and life experiences that I understood also grief as this interruptive condition where indeed like the, the transitions between one activity and another become unobvious and that might be exactly when you might be interested in in uh, continuity 
So although the book is interruptive and, and, mo and, and does keep moving and sort of jolting from one place to another, I think it is actually also deeply interested in, in transitions and how you might achieve something more river-like and mm. flowing. It's river-like. Your, your writing, I think, has a structure that is quite distinctive. Um, I'm not sure I should say this in public, but it, I, I think of it as having the structure of a snail. <laughs> it's or somehow it's spir it spirals. I think it, in a way it both has continuity and um, and an interruption in that way because it's um, it's sort of digressive, but it keeps coming back to its epicenter and and re-examining it from different angles. Um, and nothing is ever really moved on from. I think that's one of its great qualities, and it has that in common. I think with some of my favorite writers, I would include include Proust in that tradition. It's a sense of a writing that is unfolding by constantly folding back on itself and flowering um, and um, and sort of bringing everything with it. Um, and that cyclical structure, I think, I know, is I'm, common to both actually mm. this book and and this little art. I really th I really thank you for that that because I feel like um, one of the projects of the book was, or one of the sort of momentums of the book was um, how to stay with it, how to stay with something that's been initiated and, and not, um, not forget about it um, in a way that's not, not unlike some of the concerns in, in this little art you mentioned. There are lots of stories that get called sort of opened and set running in a way in that book, um, one in particular between... Um, uh, the correspondence between André Gide and Dorothy Bussey, his English language translator, and it quotes, um, the, the book quotes their correspondence, which is this sort of deep, I find kind of deeply powerful, sort of effectively charged correspondence. And I remember in sort of early drafts of the book, I'd kind of like sort of set this line running somehow, or this, um, and then felt like I wasn't actually being responsible. I wasn't really maybe doing it justice isn't quite the right word, but I wasn't really um, staying with it in the in the fullest sense, in the sense of really allowing that story or the charge of that story to, to, to unfold and to take up space. And it took me a long time to find a way of, and I still may not have, you know, because it's such a affecting um, sequence of bilingual letters that they, they wrote to each other at the end of their lives. Um, but I think here in, in the book, it's if there is going to be a baby character, and we're going to take this seriously, or I'm, <laughs> we, the composition is going to take this seriously, then we need to stay with her. We can't forget about her. We can't, we might go to the adult in the dynamic, but then what's the baby doing if we are really interested in co-living in this kind of very intensive mode? Um, and if the, you know, if if we're attending with the baby, then, the, you know, if we're with Rose, then what's Helen doing? Like how, if, because they need to be so, there's something about risking exhaustion or even exasperation on the part of the reader by the fact that actually this is going to be a day and we are going to keep, re we are going to move, but we are going to need to return to them. Um, and it, and the day will be long um, because it will feel long, um, certainly to Helen and Rose with her own time sense. And you quote, yeah. and you quote what Forster says about what distinguishes the novel from a story is that the novel is concerned with what it feels like to live in time. Um, and time does feel like the, you know, the, the central character really, this kind of thickening of time and how a day can be, a day can have any kind of duration or a day could uh, any, you know, a day could have a thousand pages or 2000 pages um, and could not be exhausted. Um, what you've just said makes me want to, ask you about process which I don't I don't really usually like to ask this question but I wonder how you did it <laughs> um how you how I think staying with it is something I struggle with I only seem to write in short form um and I wonder how you kept all those strands together um how you created the sense of all these things being kept in the air and braided and returned to and deepened and thickened but somehow all held together like that description of the mobile actually that they're sort of held in these different arrangements, but somehow still belonging to one structure. I think the mobile is in was the sort of key when I realized 
there would be a mobile. <laughs> and then there is a mobile sort of distributed through the book in the sense of the sort of graphic element of the shapes of the mobile also form a kind of rhythm through the book. <clears throat> when I started thinking of the book like a mobile, like a composition that didn't um, have a center, but rather had these parts that were offsetting each other um, and hopefully moving, sort of juddering, sometimes smashing against each other. That really helped me to think about what I thought I was doing. I think really early on, really like as soon as there are deep, as you know, like connections between this book and the, the translation book. And um, really early on, I, I had this intuition that I wanted to somehow set domestic scene of um, a domestic sort of setting for thinking through that question of comment vivre ensemble, you know. Um, it, I wanted that setting that felt like a powerful setting charged with so many um, deeply fascinating, important questions or social questions and political questions and aesthetic questions um, alongside like the novel as this. The novel is also something that requires you to stay with it if you're going to experience it because the simple fact that it's it's long, it's of, of a certain degree of length. So it does require I know there are novels that you can read in a day um, or in one go, but generally it requires you to sort of move away from it and come back to it. And then there were these other questions in the novel about knowledge and knowledge of other people and imagination and and um, and yeah, naming and sort of calling newcomers into being, you know, in, in the in the guise of characters. And I just had this intuition that there was something about scenes of. Um, living, co-living, adult and newborn, and something like novel theory, <laughs> um, theories that could speak to each other. But the difficulty was whenever I said that out loud, and even when I say that out loud now, it sounds like such an unlikely premise for a book, like, you know, really, out of what does that, yeah. And But I, it was my feeling that I, I wanted to see how I could make these two sort of sets, these registers, um, these fields of inquiry and practice sort of speak to each other. So there was this, that didn't leave me, that it, it was, um, it was really an inquiry and I really think maybe a sort of way of ending an answer, ans answer to a question that I could talk for a long time, narrate the whole process, but I really think the book is in, um, is in the key or I hope it is to be received in the key of something like preparation, um, not in the mode of accomplishment um, or achievement, but rather in the mode of working something out. And so I do see it as a sort of set of questions that someone who might be interested in writing a novel or, or um, coming at a long form might find those questions sort of renewed for them or asked in from a slightly different angle um, because they're all sort of live questions. So it's a working out of how a novel might be written rather than a kind of accomplishment of a of a novel, if that makes sense. I mean, it feels very accomplished to me. It it um and it seems to go to all the huge questions. I mean, housing is another theme that runs through the book, which again sounds like, um, you know, you could imagine it to be quite a dry or theoretical subject, but it's so embodied. Um, and you really show how all novels really are about housing. Um, or I think maybe that's a line that that Helen quotes. Maybe is it a Forster line or I can't that, quite remember. I mean, that's that's a, like how to live together mm. is 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 but saying, well, look, the, let's look to the novel mm. as a sort of repository mm. of knowledge for how one might speculatively live with other people, as like the novel is a as a not only the novel in that lecture course, but predominantly the novel. So let's look at the sanatorium, or let's you know, and I just I love that sort of lens on the novel as being a sort of source of detailed embodied information on how architectural spaces, the phenomenology of architecture. We're talking with Emily earlier about her interest in, in architecture and phenomenology, um, but the novel being a, a sort of site of inquiry for these for these important questions. And this conversation series is called yes. Entre Nous, which feels like it could be a subtitle for the book. Can we please have a big round of applause for those final comments? <laughs> yeah.
Thank you both so much for such a wonderful discussion. Um, we have a, a brief window of time left to turn to our audience members as well, who I'm sure have many, many thoughts about everything we just heard. Um, so we'll just dive straight into it, starting with the in-person audience. Raise your hand. Someone already has a hand raised. Perfect. Here we go. Uh, thanks for this wonderful talk. Um, I have a historical question. It's, I mean, it, it's kind of peculiar that, you know, that Bart um, had this sense of inadequacy um, that inspired preparation, the, the lectures that he gave on preparation for a novel. Since uh, Bach, you know, was a you know, was a pioneer of what today what we which today might call auto fiction in, in, in books like um, Camry Lucida and uh, Empire of Signs and his you know Roland Bart by Roland Bart and the Lover's Discourse and you know, he was also writing in an era in which uh, French novelists in particular had been interrogating uh, the form of the novel uh, the nouveau roman of uh, Claude Simon and Sarrot and Duras and obviously Alain Robrier, but also his friend uh, Philippe Solaire and Georges Perec. So I'm curious, you know, why why do you think Bart of all people uh, would have been haunted by this sense of of inadequacy and by this desire to write um, maybe even a more conventionally flowing novel? And also, my second question related is. Why are we going? How would you situate historically the revival of this entire debate with the emergence of a new generation of writers like Tom McCarthy or Ben Lerner or Sheila Hetty, who, in a sense, are reprising a lot of questions that French writers in particular were exploring in the 1950s and 60s? Well, um, that's a big set of questions. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I would describe it as inadequacy motivating the lecture course. I think, as I mentioned, bereavement, um, change, a desire to change, change, change your life. The, you know, the opening of that lecture course is about change and, um, and the sort of connection of a mode of living or a new form of life presenting for him as a writer, as a deeply committed in, to writing practice, as a change in writing practice. So I see it more of not coming from a space of inadequacy, but more of a space of, of renewal and um, possibility. So in an answer to that question, I, so I don't think, and I, yeah, I mean, indeed there's like some anxiety, but at the level of, of a kind of fairly sort of humorous sort of warmth of, uh, you know, will I pull a novel out of my hat after two years or, you know, preparing one in public at the Collège de France, you know, Perhaps, perhaps it, the project will be exhausted by this lecture course, which, as it, you know, as we know, it, what perhaps the lecture course is is the form that that novel can take. That, in 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 addition to sort of eight pages of of, of notes of plans. So maybe it was the most avant-garde novel of its generation. Possibly, yeah, it did, it. yeah. This sort of you know how to and there's something really I think bold and and unanxious about converting a private writing desire into a public teaching project and saying I'm going to talk through my 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 desires my hopes my um in front of this packed audience so I guess I'd push a bit back about the sort of premise of the first question but then the second question indeed like this renewal or the, in, in Anglo-American letters I think that's part of what the, this novel is trying to explore is like what are these um these interesting um, rhythms of, of, of renewed interest in which if we look at the history of the forms we're talking about, you know, if we go back, we might always find precedence. Um, what is it to sort of not locate um, Anglo-American autofictional projects in relation to uh, French, what was happening within French letters in the 60s? What is it about that sort of desire to sort of not draw out those correspondences, um, but to say, you no, know, like like Henry Fielding saying, you know, here is a whole new province of writing. So I think that question of the new and the old together is exactly um, what I'm interested in. And, and also maybe interested in um, actively holding the new and the old. There's a lot about secondhandness in the book. There's a secondhand play map, for example, that it's like the book starts with. And to, in my mind, that's like, maybe very obviously to a reader, that's a kind of metaphor for the novel. It comes in in a big hold all, which is also a bit like 
thinking of Ursula Le Guin and her bags, you know, a bit like a novel. And it's a play map that's, its spaces have been touched before, mouthed, you know. <laughs> everything's been, you know, everything's been explored here. But for Helen and her baby, it's never come into their space before. They've never dealt with it before. So I'm also, I think, interested in, in the, as well as acknowledging precedence in also sort of affirming the right to one's own new experience and one's own first time learning with a very old form, even, yeah. And you quote that wonderful um, line of Jean Paulin, um, who uh, sees a sign outside a garden saying it's forbidden to enter without carrying, it's forbidden to enter this garden carrying flowers. Um, and Paulin takes flowers to mean precedent, literary precedent, and he rephrases it and says what it should say is, it's forbidden to enter the garden without carrying flowers, which is to say that you should bring with you something from the past, some, some precedent, some model, and, and, and reinvent it in the garden. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Someone's feeling very brave and wants to raise their hand. Yes, I see one brave person. Bravo. Great bravery. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for the talk this evening. That was wonderful. Um, I just had a question, which is um, um, in your in your novel, where one of the characters um, has quite an ambiguous relationship to language, um, can't speak, but you know can communicate, um, but is not kind of should we say like acquainted with verbal arts. Um, I wondered how that was kind of in the composition process. Um, yeah. Um. Thank you. That's a, that's a really um, wonderful question. <laughs> um, in, yeah, how to write a baby. Um, I really wanted to get a sense of a baby being somewhat, I did um, de-territorialized <laughs> in the sense of like a baby taking up a lot, a small space physically, but a lot of space and in a room, you know, like, and so how you get that sense of her being unbounded, un, you know, and also not conscious of her own boundaries. Um, but indeed, like the non, um, the non-verbal, the, the mobile, one of the reasons why um, there is this sort of exploded mobile in terms of the shapes, so there are shapes that sort of, as I said earlier, sort of rhythm the book, is this, this, this sort of elemental formal language which maybe is is roses maybe is 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 belongs to rose maybe that it, that's her language of this of shapes relations contrast they're black and white um the lines are sometimes you know they're sharp in the book because it's been printed uh, sharply um but there are waves also and there are dots the book ends on dots um so that was my um yeah, that was one of the ways to try and get at a, a, another language, to have the novel hold another language, a visual language um, that isn't solely sort of um, swallowed by the by the verbal, by the by the literary, by the that actually it sort of sticks out. It can't be it can't be sort of consumed by it. 